you would take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Our scripture reading this morning, Ephesians 4. I'm going to read together verses 7 through 13. Verses 7 through 13. Follow along in your copy of Scripture as I read beginning in verse 7. <clears throat> Paul writes, he says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Just a word, brief word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we pray that through this passage we would see the uh, wonderful benefit of diversity within the unity of the local church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in 1908, um, a Jewish immigrant from Russia and, uh, wrote a play entitled The Melting Pot. And that play depicts uh, a, a Russian Jewish immigrant family named the Kizanos. Kiz Kizanos, I believe it might be pronounced. And David Kizano was a survivor of a pogrom in Russia. And uh, in that pogrom, both his mother and his sister were killed. It was a horrific time in David's past. And uh, having come to America, he wanted to forget the past and look forward, and look forward with hope and with promise. So in this play, he composed an American symphony. And the idea of this symphony was that it would look forward to, by, in music, it would look forward to a, a, a free society, a society that was free of ethnic divisions and hatred that is so common among uh, peoples of the world. At a key point in the play, David is speaking to his wife, Vera, and he says this. He says, there she lies, the great melting pot. Listen, can you hear the roaring and the bubbling? There gapes her mouth, and he, at this point he points east toward, the, uh, toward uh, the Statue of Liberty, toward Ellis Island. He points east. He says, the harbor where a thousand mammoth feeders come from the ends of the world to pour in their human freight. Ah, what a stirring and a seething, Celt and Latin, Slav and Teuton, Greek and Syrian, black and yellow. And Vera says, Jew and Gentile. David, yes, east and west, north and south, the palm and the pine, the pole and the equator, the crescent and the cross, how, how the great alchemist melts and fuses them with his purging flame. Here shall they all unite to build the Republic of Man. Well, that play's title stuck as a description for the ideal American society, the melting pot, where uh, peoples come from all over the world as immigrants, so all kinds of different backgrounds and cultures and so forth, and they come to this country and form one great, one great society, one great culture, one great American nation. And they do so uh, probably to some degree perhaps because of their diversity. This great diverse people come and form one nation. What's that have to do with Ephesians chapter 4? Well, in Ephesians 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling wherewith you have been called. You, you, and, you who are believers in Christ, you're to walk worthy of that calling as a Christian. In verse 2, he explains what that worthy walk will be characterized by with some of these characteristics or qualities. He says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering." forbearing one another in love. And then in uh, verses 4 through 6, verses three, verse 3, he says, we are to come as a, a variety of people to this one place, the church, 
and do so endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In verses 4 through 6, he talks about what that unity entails. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So he's calling in verses 1 through 6 for us to, as believers in Christ, followers of Christ, to walk as Christians in maintaining the unity of the body of Christ. But in that unity that is the body of Christ, Paul goes on to affirm in verses 7 and following that there is a great diversity. There is, if you will, a melting pot in the church. So in the, in the unity, there is a diversity, a unity that is to be maintained. There is a diversity that is to be appreciated. Now, let me explain what I mean by this diversity. In our culture today, you talk about diversity and you're automatically talking about a diversity of cultures and cultural backgrounds, the differences that people have because of their, uh, maybe their ethnic background or maybe their upbringing and whatever. And, and we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. All of that is true in the church of, in, in any size, a church of any size. There's going to be people of different backgrounds and so on and so forth. But that's not what Paul is focusing on here. And by the way, there has been an awful lot of discussion I've seen lately uh, in regarding the ministry of a local church and saying if your church does not reflect the cultural differences in your community, you're somehow failing the community. And you have to do what you can to try to reflect all the different cultures in your community in your local church. Well, th whether or not that is what a, the local church looks like is not the point. It's not Paul's point. The diversity he's talking about here is not a diversity of culture. What he means is, what he is talking about is a diversity of gifts. So, for example, in uh, Romans chapter 12, he talks about this same subject. And in Romans 12, verse 6, he says, "...having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us." And then he goes on talking about some of these different gifts that are uh, evident and should be evident in the church. Differing gifts. The same theme comes up in 1 Corinthians 12 and verses 4 and following. He says, "...now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit." There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. And in verse 12, he says, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into the one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. And he goes on to talk about if the foot shall say, I don't need the hand, or the hand, I don't need the foot, and so on and so forth. So he's talking here about, in Ephesians chapter 4, when he talks about the diversity in the church, he's talking about the diversity of gifts within the church. That's the focus. And that diversity, I want you to notice in verses 7 to 10, that diversity reflects gracious gifts that have been given by Christ. Christ is the one who gives gifts, and he gives gifts to all of us. Notice this in verse, um, in verse 7. He says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. To every one. To every one. So everyone is the recipient of the, everyone, who, uh, everyone who's a member of the body of Christ is a recipient of this gracious giftedness from the Lord Jesus Christ. And because it is a gracious gift, we have no claim on it whatsoever. We have no inherent, mer inherent merit that we would be able to claim it. We are given grace. I think of this in contrast to Korah in the Old Testament. Remember Korah, uh, who rebelled against Moses? In Numbers chapter 16, 
Uh, Moses was doing his job as he was called to do. And the interesting thing about Korah is that Korah was a Levite. So he was in that tribe of Israel that was given the gift of serving in the tabernacle and serving as a, uh, a helper in the worship of God. But Korah rebelled against Moses and basically said, who do you think you are that you get to be the ruler over all of us? You're no better than any of the rest of us. Why do you think you should be able to do that? Now, Korah's problem was he did not understand grace. He didn't understand that Moses was doing what Moses was doing simply because God in his grace called Moses to do it. And Korah was given responsibility for what Korah was given responsibility for because God had graciously given him that responsibility. Now listen, if it's grace, we have no claim on it. We don't have any merit of ourselves that we can say, God, you owe me this particular gift. No, Christ gives it out of grace. But also because it's grace, not only do we have no claim on it, no inherent merit to deserve any giftedness by our Savior. We therefore also have no room to boast. We have no room for pride. And Paul is not talking here about our innate giftedness that is perhaps due to our DNA or you know, our, our abilities that have been developed through, uh, through hard work and effort through study and practice. All those things are great, and all those things are useful in the cause of Christ. But that's not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about ways in which Christ graciously gifts us that are, for the most part, apart from those inherent talents or gifts that we have by birth, by our nature. Notice, secondly here, that Christ gives those gifts as he measures them out. Again, verse 7, every one of us, unto every one of us, grace is given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Your gift is one among many, and, it is, and, and there's no one that has all of it. There's no one that has them all. And the thing of it is that sometimes those of us with lesser natural gifts, natural endowments or talents or whatever, God can graciously use us in ways that surpass those who are even more talented than we. One of the, one of the preachers I like to listen to uh, because I, I, find his, uh, I find his preaching very, uh, very edifying and biblically accurate, Alistair Begg. He, um, he, I've heard him on more than one occasion confess that when it comes to his innate abilities in certain areas, and he's talked about what those areas are, he says, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a muck when it comes to those things. I, I mean, I just don't have the abilities. I don't have those abilities. I had to find people around me that could take care of those things and, because I just do not have those abilities whatsoever. We didn't have those abilities, but God has graciously given him other abilities and to the extent that he has uh, a global ministry and God has graciously gifted him for that. Christ gives gifts as he measures them out. And then notice how Christ sovereignly gives the gifts as he sees fit. He gifts, he gifts according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And here's the point. It is the sovereign prerogative of our Lord Jesus Christ to give what he wants to whom he wants. You remember that little interaction with Jesus and Peter after the resurrection there by the seaside? Uh, they've had breakfast and eaten those fish. And then, and then Jesus gets along with Peter and takes him aside and says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, well, yeah, yeah, you know I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Well, yes, you know I love you, feed my sheep. He asked him the third time, do, do you love me? And Peter's a little, little miffed here because this is the third time he's been asked, and he's third time he says, well, yes, you know I love you. He says, well, feed my sheep. And then Jesus goes on to tell Peter, 
uh, what's going to happen in the future regarding Peter's ministry. He basically says, you're going to die a martyr's death. And then, then Peter looks at John, and he says, well, what about him? What about him? Isn't that our natural tendency? Isn't that our nature? You know, we have our area of giftedness. We have what we are given to do, what God would call us to do and would have us to do, and we sense that, and maybe we get involved in that to some degree. But then we start looking around and say, well, hey, what about her? What about him? What, what are they supposed to be doing? And Jesus, Jesus says, if I want him to live until I come again, what is that to you? In other words, it's none of your business how I'm going to gift him and use him. My gifts, Jesus is communicating, um, we could say, he's communicating to Peter, my gifts are mine to give to whom I will and what I will. Christ sovereignly gives those gifts as he sees fit. And then in verses 8 to 10, there's this interesting uh, statement. It's a for the most part, a quotation from Psalm 68, the psalm that we read earlier, verse 8 is, and then an explanation in verses 9 and 10. And a little interesting because of the application here of this, this giftedness. And basically what verses 8, and 8 through 10 are telling us is that, that Christ gives gifts that he took in victory, and he gives those gifts that he took in victory to those whom he took in victory. You say, what? Well, let me, let me show you. Let me explain. In verse 8, it says, he, he's, he's sort of quoting Psalm 68, 18, where he says, Wherefore he said, When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Now, that's obviously speaking of Christ. He's applying this to Christ. And he gave gifts unto men. Well, when did Christ... When did Christ lead captivity captive? He ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and then he gave gifts to men. Verses 9 and 10 sort of explain that. It says, now that, he, now that he ascended, you know, Christ has since ascended, he's at the Father's right hand. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now, that last part of verse 9 has created quite a bit of ink to be spilled in terms of interpretation. What does it mean that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth? Some think that that's talking about Christ. You know, that Christ went to hell, and he preached in hell, and caused, gave people in hell a second chance to be saved. I don't accept that interpretation. And then another one is simply that he came to earth, and I think that's part of it. But it's the lower parts of the earth, and here I think the reference is to the grave. He descended, Christ first descended to the lower parts of the earth. He descended into the grave, but then he ascended. He ascended. He that descended, verse 10 says, is the same also that ascended far above heavens that he might fill all things. So verses 9 and 10 are basically saying this, that Christ conquered by his incarnation, by his coming to this earth, dying on a cross, being buried in a tomb, rising again from that tomb, and ascending back to heaven, having accomplished that which he came to do. He conquered by his coming to this earth and dying on a cross, rising from the tomb, ascending back to heaven. And in that conquering, he then captured for himself captive souls. He led captivity, those who were captive to sin and its curse. That is, you, me. Every human being on this planet is a captive to the curse of sin, every one of us. But in his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ led captivity captive. There are those here in this room this morning who, are, who have been released from the captivity of the curse of sin. I trust you have been. Have you? 
Have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Have you called upon Him to save you? Has He in His grace opened your blind eyes to see Him for who He is and opened your heart to see your sinfulness and to turn from your sinfulness and turn to the Savior? Well, I trust you have because here's the thing. When you turn to Christ in saving faith, repentant, saving faith, you were released from captivity to the curse of sin, but then you were taken captive by the grace and the love and the mercy and the kindness of the loving Savior who gave his life for you. So verse 9 and 10 are talking about how Christ in his incarnation came to this earth, died on a cross, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, so that he might lead captivity captive. He might take those captive to the curse of sin, lead them out of that captivity, and bring them into captivity, quote-unquote, to himself, that they might be his own people, his own children. They are... Now, look on the back of your bulletin, if you still have that handy, and look at verse 18. Verse 18 says that he led captivity captive and received gifts from men. He received gifts. Paul here applying that verse, Psalm 68, 18, applying it here in Ephesians 4, 8, he says he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Is Paul abusing the scriptures here? How do we resolve that? Oh, here's the answer. Here's the resolution to that. What Christ did in leading captivity captive is he received gifts. He received the gifts of these captives. Now, the psalmist and this whole description is um, employing something that would be very easily and readily understood in the, in the culture of the time, where a conquering army led by a conqueror would go into, a, would go into an en enemy territory and do battle against that enemy, and uh, the conqueror would lead his army in to, to conquer that, that enemy, that foe. And then when that enemy is conquered, the conqueror, the leader of that army, would then take captive souls, people, from that enemy territory and, and then bring them back to his home as captives. He would take those captives captive for himself and lead them back and receive those gifts of the captive souls, prisoners, lead them back, receiving them as gifts for himself to use as he wanted to use the conqueror, he the conqueror wanted to use for his own selfish ends, for the benefit of his kingdom. So Paul is taking that imagery and applying it to Christ in this spiritual warfare, this spiritual battle that was waged on the cross. Christ conquered on the cross and conquered from the tomb when he rose again from the tomb. And then he led captivity captive. He led souls of men and women who were captured to the curse of sin. He led them captive to himself, receiving those captured souls unto himself for his kingdom. But then what does he do with them? See, what does he do with those he captures? He gives them as gifts. He turns around and takes those whom he has captured for himself, leading captivity captive, and he turns around and gives them as gifts to men, specifically to the church. And he gave those captive souls as gifts to the church we see in verse 11. So take out the parentheses a minute, okay? And read from verses 8 to 11 and leave out verses 9 and 10. Not that you're taking them out of your Bible, but they are parenthetical. They're explanatory. 
and, and get the connection with the gifts, okay? So the end of verse 8, he says, he is, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, and he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers. He goes on talking about these gifts that he gave. I would have you notice that the gifts that Paul is talking about in this passage are not abilities or spiritual gifts, but they are persons. And these gifts that are persons are graciously gifted by the gracious Savior. So see, first of all, that this diversity in the church reflects gracious gifts. And that diversity is then reflected in the church in varied ministry. Look again at verse 11, the gifts that he gave. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastor teachers. What's Im incredibly important for us to understand before we look at those four areas of giftedness is that they play a crucial role in the church. They play a crucial role in the church. Now, I mention that because Paul emphasizes the fact that these are gifts to the church, and yet there are some churches that see no need for some of these gifts. I, and I'm spe specifically focusing on the gifts that are for today. There are some churches that see no gifts, or no need for the gift, for example, of the pastor teacher. I know, for example, of a church where um, a few years back, the, the, the pastor, there was a pastor of the church, and the pastor got into some legal problems and um, ended up being removed from the church, forcibly removed from the church, not by the congregation, but by the authorities. And because the congregation was then so burned by a pastor teacher, they've concluded, well, we really don't need one. We'll just get by week after week without one. We'll just divide up the responsibilities of, uh, you know, pulpit ministry and so forth among, uh, among the men in the church, and we'll not have a pastor. We'll not have a pastor teacher in the church. Well, that is basically saying to Christ, we don't need one of the gifts that you have given to the church, you see. There are others who have sort of a cavalier attitude toward the gift, they're like Lone Ranger Christians who, who don't feel like they need either a church or a pastor. And I, I think sometimes that those who have this attitude, they perhaps have a cavalier attitude toward the giver of the gifts, where Christ doesn't really have a whole lot to do with their everyday existence either, and yet they still want to name the name of Christian. And yet there are some who are in this category of having sort of a cavalier attitude toward the gifts, but they have that attitude because they have indeed been injured. They've been harmed by an abusive pastor, for example. And therefore, they're, they're arm's length from ever having a pastor again. I understand that. My prayer for folks in that condition is that that God will graciously give them the ability give them the faith to trust in him the giver of those gifts because he will give give the gifts of pastor teacher to his church that will be beneficial and helpful in other words because because these ministry leaders are given as a gift to the church and they play a crucial role in the church, they need to be appreciated by the church. Now look at these ministry leaders that Christ has given to the church here in, verses 11, in verse 11. And he names four of them. And I would point out that the first two are gifts that are no longer given to the church. And I'll explain why. He gave some apostles and some prophets. These two gifts were given for the foundation of the church. 
and its founding. Look, look back at chapter 2 for a minute at verses 19 and 20, and I, I think this will help us understand. And Paul is writing to the, at the church at Ephesus. It's now made up of Jew and Gentile, and he says, You are therefore no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and you are built upon the foundation, here we go, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the, the role of the apostles and the prophets was to be foundational. The apostles, we might say, were charter witnesses of Christ, and they were handpicked by Jesus to testify of him. And there are no more apostles, those who are charter witnesses, eyewitnesses of Christ, handpicked by him and needing to be foundational for the church. And likewise, prophets. The role of the prophet in that first century was to be foundational in the sense that before the canon of Scripture was completed, these individuals functioned frequently in local churches to communicate the Word of God to the congregation before the Word of God was completely written. I mean, see, you think about this, if you will. Here are believers in Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. They meet together once a week, maybe more, maybe daily. But whenever they met together, they didn't sit in a building like this in nice, comfortable pews with a, with a Bible in their hand that they could, they could open and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. They couldn't do that. It wasn't there yet. So other than the Old Testament scriptures, which were completed, and most of them even wouldn't have had a copy of that, what then did they, what did they listen to? What did they hear? Where did they, where did they get a word from God? It came from the prophets, those whom God had gifted for that time as foundational, laying a foundation work uh, in the local church, the apostles and the prophets. Now, both of those gifts Christ doesn't give to the church anymore. The foundation has been laid. It is the role of pastor, teachers, and evangelists beyond that to build on that foundation. Now, what about evangelists? What about evangelists? Usually in our mind, we think of evangelists as the, uh, the itinerant uh, preachers who come into a church and they you know, preach a series of meetings, maybe, I mean, it used to be long meetings. It used to come in for a couple weeks at a time, maybe a month at a time. Um, those eventually got shortened to no more than a week. And uh, churches that have evangelists on a regular basis now may even shorten those to, you know, like a Sunday through Wednesday kind of meetings. There's not a thing in the world wrong with itinerant preachers doing that work. But this term is broader than that and, and, and has greater application than simply coming to a church for a few days and preaching a message and then going on to another place. The evangelist, as Paul is speaking of it here, is more like a, a church planter that goes into an area, proclaims the gospel, and has a, has a particular burden for and a gift to reach the lost and get the, get the founding, uh, establishing building blocks, if you will, of a local church. And they get that church established uh, with a nucleus of believers, and that church calls its own pastor teacher, and the evangelist, the, the, if you will, the church planter, then moves to another area in that region to plant another church. So get a good example of this. I had a conversation the other day with a, a missionary that we had visit here 14 years ago, Robert Coelho, Roberto Coelho. He is a Brazilian guy, married a, or no, um, now that I think of it, I'm not sure, I don't think he is a Brazilian, but his wife is Brazilian. And he's been in, serving in Brazil for the last uh, 12 years. And uh, we had a conversation, we got to talking, and he's wanting to come here in uh, September for a meeting. I'm going to have him come back. And um, he was talking about the, the, the church that he went to, to try to plant 12 years ago is now, has now built um, the first floor of a building, and it's about ready to be turned over to a national pastor. And when they go back on the field uh, later this year, I think it is, 
Uh, his, his, his goal, his objective, is to finalize the transition of that ministry to a local pastor, a national pastor, and then he's moving to another area in Brazil, in the same state of Brazil, to plant another church. That's the work of an evangelist, someone who has that kind of giftedness and that kind of ability. And then there's the pastor-teacher. Uh, and those two words there at the end of verse 11 form one office or one gift, one area of giftedness, the pastor-teacher. You could put a hyphen there and realize it's one, uh, one role. William Hendrickson, in commenting on the role of the pastor-teacher, says that by means, explains this way, he says, by means of expounding the word, these men shepherd the flocks. Let me give you, I found this interesting um, comparison contrast between evangelists and pastor teachers. I found this to be helpful. I hope you do too. Evangelists are called to a field, a region, a field. Pastor teachers are called to a church. Evangelists, their primary, their primary burden is the lost. The primary burden of a pastor teacher is the saved. An evangelist goes out to the world. A pastor teacher comes in to a church. I hope that helps you distinguish between those two areas of giftedness. Both are needed. Both are essential. And Christ gives those gifts. Now, verses 12 and 13 show us that those diversified gifts seek a noble end. The diversity that is to exist in the church, it seeks a noble end. Now, look at verse 12 again, and in verse 12 is, I think, unhelpfully punctuated in the King James. And just a reminder that commas and periods and so forth are not in the original writing. Greek language didn't have periods and commas. So verse 12 looks in the King James like it's a bullet point list. These, this is what pastors are supposed to do. They're supposed to perfect the saints, they're supposed to do the work of the ministry, and they're supposed to edify the body of Christ, like three bullet points in a job description. Instead, you need to look at this as a linear progression. God calls and equips pastor teachers for the work of the ministry, or, or for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, Pastor teachers do the perfecting of the saints. The saints do the work of the ministry. And all together, there is the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, that last item, the edifying of the body of Christ, is the goal. That's the goal of this diversified giftedness. Look at this goal. As one, the church, the local church, needs to strive for this same general goal, using the diversity in the church, but striving for the same general goal. And what is that general goal? The building up of the body of Christ. It's another way of talking about a, a, a spiritually mature church. The goal, the ultimate goal of the diversified giftedness that finds itself in a local church, the ultimate goal is to have a spiritually mature congregation of believers, followers of Christ. What does that spiritual maturity look like? Verse 13 goes on to explain. It looks like these three things. It looks like doctrinal unity, where we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, doctrinal unity, it looks like very practical, very practical spiritual maturity. See this in the next statement. Unto a perfect or a complete, well-rounded man, a mature man, now, what does that look like? That's a good question, isn't it? You, you, Paul throws these things out. Well, what's a, what's a mature man look like? Well, look, look over to another writing of Paul's, Titus chapter 2. 
and we get uh, an interesting description of how aged or mature men should look. In Titus chapter 2, Paul tells Titus to speak the things which become sound doctrine. Teach those things that will, that will be edifying to the church. Like what? That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Now these things that should, that should characterize the mature men of the church, you see the parallel, you see the, make the connection back to Ephesians chapter 4, that we, what we want, the ultimate goal for the, the diversified gifts of the church is to work toward a spiritually mature congregation that will look like these spiritually mature older men, sound in the faith, sober, grave, temperate, self-controlled. This is what maturity, practical spiritual maturity looks like. And then the third thing Paul mentions in verse 13 that is uh, a description of a spiritually mature church is personal Christ-likeness. He says, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That phrase, the fullness of Christ, doesn't that take us back to chapter 3, verse 19, when Paul is praying that we might know the love of Christ that passes knowledge so that we might be filled with all the fullness of God? And when we talked about that, we explained, explained that that fullness of God is simply Christ-likeness in our lives. This is what spiritual maturity looks like. This is what a spiritually mature body of believers looks like. There's doctrinal unity. There's practical spiritual maturity. And then there is personal Christ-likeness. We, as individuals, within that body of believers, we reflect the character of Christ. We reflect well on Christ. But here's the thing. And this takes us back to that linear progression of verse 12. As individuals, as individuals, we endeavor to reach that goal, even using our diversity. So the pastor teacher, his function, his role, is to equip. The, that gift of the pastor teacher is given to equip it's for the perfecting or equipping of the saints. That word perfect doesn't mean to make, to make you perfect. I can't do that. I can't do that. It isn't going to happen in this life where you're going to be completely perfect. What, what's it talking about? The word is used in um, Matthew chapter 4 of um, these two, two men who are going to be called as disciples of Christ, followers of Christ, who are sitting by the sea mending their nets. They're mending their nets. They've been out fishing, and after their night of fishing, their time of fishing, they come in, and that's what fishermen do. They go through their nets, and they look for any, any area that needs to be fixed, any area that needs to be mended. So the point is, and using that term here, what Paul is saying is that the pastor teacher engages in a healing, restorative ministry using the word. Fishermen will use, use fabric, they'll use those, you know, a needle and fabric and work the, the threads in to fix the net. The pastor teacher uses the word, the word of God, expounding it, teaching it to bring a restorative health to God's people. And then what do they do with that? What do they do with that? They then serve every saint. Every saint is to serve. You see this? It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the saints to do the work of ministry, the work of serving. Ian Hamilton, in his commentary on this passage, he says this, listen. He says, the ministry of the word is never merely to inform, enlighten, and expand our minds. God has given the ministry of his word to his church 
in order to transform it, to heal it of its various spiritual sicknesses, to make it whole and restore it to a fit working order, thereby enabling it to exercise a work of ministry that will build up the body of Christ. This is the work of the ministry. This is the call to diversity and employing that various diversity for the perfecting of the body of Christ, the building up of the body of Christ. All right, so in closing, let me ask you three questions. Let me ask three questions. First of all, have you personally, have you been freed from your captivity to the curse of sin and been taken captive by the loving, saving grace of Christ Jesus? Oh, I implore you, let him take you captive today. Turn to him in repentant faith and trust Christ today and find deliverance from your captivity to the curse of sin and find freedom in the captivity to Christ. Secondly, are you taking for granted the gracious gifts that the Lord has given to his church? Just taking them for granted? And then thirdly, are you personally actively engaged in the building process of the church? Or, or are you more like what uh, my grandson and grandsons and I and son Scott did the other night, went to the basketball game, sat on the bleachers and watched, enjoyed the guys working, going up and down the court. Didn't enjoy the outcome of the game, but enjoyed the guy's work. Is that, is that how church is to you, like a spectator? Or, or are you actively engaged in the building process of the church? Here's the thing. To really appreciate the diversity of the church, you need to be a part of it. Our Father and our God, I pray this morning for this local church. I thank you so much. Thank you so much for those whom you have given and the gifts that you have given. Thank you for the growth, the development, the maturing that is taking place in the lives of your people through your word. But Father, I do pray if there's anyone in this room that is still held captive to the curse of sin, I pray that Christ would set them free, taking them captive to himself and then turning around and giving them as a gracious gift to the church. And Lord, I pray that you would renew our appreciation for the local church, for the gifts that you give to it. I pray that we would give ourselves as your people, as your gifts to the church to help in the building and strengthening and maturing of it. This we pray in Jesus' name.